Hello, and welcome to another message from God's Way Through Christ Ministry, where we aspire to live life on purpose through the sharing of God's Word. Here is Pastor Nate with today's message. Hello, and welcome to another message from God's Way Through Christ Ministry. Thank you for joining us for this Sunday sermon, the Sunday message. This is where we study, learn, and abide along our personal journeys, along our daily walk with Christ. And if there's one thing that I know for sure, that is, there is our way and there is God's way. Father, we we thank you for this opportunity to once again come together and fellowship to break the bread of your word, that it uh, be fuel and nourishment for our hearts and minds and spirits. God, we know that there are those who are downtrodden, who are have broken spirits, who are dealing with challenges and struggles today, right now, and, the, and they need an encouraging word. God, I pray that this message lands in their ears and on their hearts to penetrate the dark places, to enable them to be encouraged, to be lifted up, to find hope and encouragement through your word, through your message, through your promises, through your protection, through your comfort, peace, joy, mercy, and grace, all of the many gifts that you have bestowed upon us. God, I pray that you use me as your vessel to deliver your word to your people, that it may encourage them to draw closer to you. This we ask and pray in your precious son, Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Today, I want to talk about winning Uh, in a world where there's been so much loss, too much loss. uh, in, In fact, we so many people have have been lost, especially over these past few years. There's there's hardly a life that has gone untouched by loss, um, and it's still occurring. It, it's not over. Many are, many are fatigued. They're they're overwhelmed uh, with losing so much. People, jobs, ways of life quality of life. Um, So this is precisely why today I want to talk about winning. Um, Today's text is taken from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8. It's widely understood that uh, this particular chapter was intended to bring consolation to the Lord's people, comfort them, and assuage their their fears and pain and grief. My hope today is that this word, God's word, will do just that. So I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, verses starting at verse 28. uh, Romans chapter 8, starting at verse verse 28. I'm going to read from the NIV. Verse 28 goes, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. He appointed them to be saved in keeping with his purpose. God planned that those he had chosen would become like his son. In that way, Christ will be the first and most honored among many brothers. And those God has planned for, he also appointed to be saved. Those he appointed, he has made right with himself. To those he has made right with himself, he has given his glory. What should we say then, since God is on our side, who can be against us? God did not spare his own son. He gave him up for us all. Then won't he also freely give us everything else? Who can bring any charge against God's chosen ones? God makes us right with himself. Who can sentence us to death? Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also 
praying for us. He died. More than that, he was raised to life. Who can separate us from Christ's love? Can trouble or hard times or harm or hunger? Can nakedness or danger or, or, or war? It is written, because of you, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be killed. No, in all these things, we will do even more than win. We owe it all to Christ who loved us. I am absolutely sure that not even death or life can separate us from God's love. Not even angels or demons, the present or the future or any powers can do that. Not even the highest places or the lowest or anything in all creation can do that. Nothing at all can ever separate us from God's love because of what Christ Jesus our Lord has done. So we talked last week, Easter, the celebration of Jesus being the sacrifice, of paying for our sins, of paying the, the price as being a sacrifice that we didn't ask for, nor do we deserve, and, and him dying on the cross and being resurrected. That is what that is referring to. Because of that act, because of his sacrifice, we, we have a, a bond, a closeness. We have God's unyielding love. So the title topic then for today is, We Will Win. We will win. When our life is with God, or our life is with God, as, as to say his, his hands uh, under his watch, cared for by his protection. There is no better place for our lives to be, nor was there ever intended to be. We have been gifted a lifetime manufacturer's warranty on our life. Know that God works for our good. God works for your good. How could we be any more confident than in knowing that the creator of the world, the creator of everything, is working on our behalf? There is, has probably no doubt been, been times we have had to rely on others, unsure if they will do what they said they would do, and we've probably been let down more times than we have been pleasantly surprised that our expectations were exceeded. So with that, I can understand your hesitation, uh, or if you have reservations about God helping you from a man's perspective, know this. It is a truth that you can stake your life on. In, in, in Romans 8 and 28 in the NIV, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The Amplified expands it, talks about uh, assured and no. God is being a partner in their labor all things working together and are fitting into a plan. So if you have a plan, that means there's been some thought given to it. That means that there is a, a goal to achieve. That means that there is a purpose, and it's a God purpose. It talks about his design. So God designed it, created it, brought it into existence, has a plan for it, we're talking about us and our lives and our and our purpose. So that, that's such strong language that's being used here. So this should instill an overwhelming sense of peace. All, not some, not this one and, and that one or or a few, but all as in everything. 
So what is meant by working for the good? It, it, it means that the, the tests that we face and endure make us stronger, that the pain that we experience make us more resilient. Sorrow makes us seek and appreciate joy and peace. Trials that test our faith strengthen it, enabling us to persevere. Rejection leads to us to seek inclusion and embrace our relationship with God, the one who will never forsake us. Discord causes us to seek harmony, and confusion stirs us to invite, grasp, and grow our wisdom. So the, the main point here is that in every challenge, difficulty, trial, test, tribulation, and adversity, there is learning inside of it. If we look, we can find and benefit from it. If we look, and if we love God, not only will we find it, but we will be able to activate the truth, the good fruit, the wisdom, the gift in our lives, thereby enhancing our lives, not diminishing and destroying, as was the enemy's point, goal, plan, with their feeble attempt to try to dissuade us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, in the Amplified, it says, For those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning, foreordaining them, to be molded into the image of his Son and share inwardly, his likeness, that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he thus foreordained, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified, acquitted, made righteous, putting them in right standing with himself. And those who he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition or state of being. So we know that we go through a process of being selected for certain positions, and there's a qualification process and a vetting process and what we have to go through. God took care of all of that for the highest order role in the land, in the world that he created. There's, there's no work to be done on your part to earn what God has already accomplished, finished. When Christ said it is finished, it was done before you began. So again, there's, there's the, the world's ways we have to qualify ourselves and earn it and, and pay bribery and do all sorts of things that are not in line with the plan of God. That is God's love for us. God has a master plan. He knew us before we were born, before we were even created. What is it? I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. You are not an accident. Know this. You are not a mistake. Embrace that or wasted space. Settle that matter once and for all. You were created with intention. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. God, the creator of all, he does not make mistakes. If he has a plan, a master plan, if he knew you before, the miracle that has to occur for a life to be born in and of itself, you can't possibly be a mistake. Not as a creation of God. You were created for a divine reason and purpose. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The mold you were made from was the greatest mold that ever was. God created man in his own image. He created Jesus first. Jesus is our brother. We were created in that way, in that manner. That was a perfect mold. And we have a likeness on the inside, it says. So you are, in effect, royalty 
So stop acting like a peasant. That might be part of the problem. When you're doing what you are not supposed to, and you are where you are not supposed to be, you become somebody that you're not. So going about each day in that manner is, yeah, that's going to invite confusion. You're going to feel and seem out of place. So you're not who you, are, who you were created, designed, the master plan, who you're supposed to be. Instead of going the way God in, in, intended for people to go, when, when they go in their own way, that's where, that's where the problems come in. When we're on the path of our own determination and destiny, like, we, like we've created something. And if we call ourselves Christians, belonging to the body of Christ and having the mind of Christ, then we know, we know that we know that God's way is incomparably far, far better than any our way or man's way could ever be. So when, when things go according to God's plan, we will be rescued when he determines its time. We will be elevated to the height that he sees fit. We will receive the blessings intended for us in accordance with his measure and an endless source he has. We will be comforted always at all times. Anything else from any other source will pale by comparison, being woefully inept in meeting our needs. God's way is the best, greatest, surest, most sustainable, and longest lasting. Why bother with cheap imitations or false imitators? Especially when your life depends on it. We are more than conquerors. I, I love that verse. A verse that many have heard, but I'm not sure fully understand. Just as sure as you are breathing, you will face adversity in this life. If you haven't, keep living. Most of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you are in the midst of a trial or several right now at this very moment. It hurts. I get it. It's painful. It's, it's draining. You're tired of fighting every day. It, it appears unfair or unjust and, and even undeserving. There's, there's no justifiable excuse for why you are being treated so poorly. You may even be asking yourself, why me? Why, what, what did I do to, to deserve this? Why is this happening to me? Or I don't see how I will ever be able to overcome this. Let me share a verse that should bring you peace and relief. Relief. Uh, Romans 8 and 37 in the Amplified. Yet amid all these things, we are more than conquer conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. More than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. First, what does it mean to be a conqueror? To, to conquer, the Greek translation is to have complete triumph, win a most thorough victory. So being more than conquerors means to have an overwhelming victory, won by a landslide, not even close to describing. I mean, it's as if you were the only one on the court, on the field, on the track, by yourself, so far. You're passing the last person on your way to victory and they have more laps to go, to be triumphantly victorious, to gain a surpassing victory. Okay, Pastor, I hear you, but I'm still overwhelmed. Okay, Romans 8 and 35 in the NIV. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So this verse should bring further encouragement to your heart for the, for those times when it is so bad, when so painful, so immobilizing and paralyzing that we either don't know what to do or lack the strength and energy to even move. Here is where the Holy Spirit that lives within us acts on our behalf, pleading our case to God, able to put into words what we simply cannot, able to represent our heart's desire when we're unable, able to reconcile our mind, body, and spirit with God, so that we may be delivered from or through whatever it is that we're facing. Better stronger, wiser, more complete, and at peace. We can comprehend this when hiring the, the best attorney money can buy. But this, this, however, is far better, greater, and more effective than the best this world has to offer. So much so, it is difficult for our minds to comprehend, yet trust and know. Anyhow, final point is this, God loves us, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. I want to say that again. God loves us, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. God. This is the best news of all. As such, it should bring us great comfort and possibly even joy, but most assuredly, it should bring us peace. In Romans 8 and 35 in the NIV, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? The Amplified expands on that. Basically, sh should suffering separate us? No. Affliction? No. Tribulation or calamity? No. No. Distress? No. Even destitution? No. None of those separate us from God's love embrace this passage as who would dare try? Who thinks that they are bad enough, big enough, powerful enough to even try? It's futile to think that anything could accomplish that, but who dare even try? That's what that is, is, is saying. Nothing we face deal with or encounter no problem, issue, trauma, trying circumstance, or tragedy, no difficulty, wrong act, mistake, or even sinful behavior will separate us from this love. I'm going to go back and say that again. Nothing we face, deal with, encounter, no problem, issue, trauma, trying circumstance, or tragedy, no difficulty, wrong act, mistake, or sinful behavior will separate us from this love. There's only one exception to what God won't forgive, and that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is an act that is intentional. You know what you're doing. It's deliberate, it's belligerent, you don't accidentally, it's purpose. You're not doing that. So everything else that you've done, those are sins forgiven. That is why Jesus died on the cross, for you, to save you, for me, to save me, to save us from those sins, from those mistakes, from those bad choices. Call it what it is. But God has elevated us. He has saved us. He has given us the gift of salvation. In Romans 
chapter 8. I'm going to read verse 38 and 39 from the Amplified. For I am persuaded beyond doubt, am sure, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things impending and threatening nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing in this world prevented God from sacrificing his only son for us, for our sins, so that we may be saved. Nothing in this world was able to convince or prevent Christ from fulfilling his earthly assignment, because he loved us because what he did was for us to wash away our sins. This act alone is a clear demonstration of, as any, of how much God loves us, his children, his creations, how far he is willing to go. Yes, it may feel like we are separated at times based on what we have to face, but no, that is not the case. In fact, that is what the world, the enemy, wants us to believe. The enemy wants us to think we have been forsaken, that God has turned his back on us. For us to lose faith, give up, and give in to the ways of this world, that may, in fact, be the very reason you are being tested. God knows what is inside of you, and if God knows, the enemy knows. And if the enemy can get you off of the path that God has placed you on to distract you, and he's going to distract you not by people you hate, but by people you love and know that those that can get close to you, then the enemy wins, and you go off in disbelief and lacking in faith and succumb to whatever attack that you are having to deal with. Know that. And, and, and when you encounter distractions, name them. That is a distraction from the enemy. I'm not today. Not today. I'm on a path. I'm on a purpose. I was predestined. I was created. I was created by the creator, and he loves me. And so this, no. Look upon adversity as an opportunity to strengthen your face. It's just like when you go to the gym and you want to do uh, strength training, right? We use the weights as resistance to tear down the, the muscle and, and rebuild it stronger and better and more capable. So when we turn the tables on the enemy and, and leverage the resistance, right, we build our faith. We build our character. We build and strengthen our relationship with God. So the attacks, the challenges, the adversity, those are dumbbells. That's what they call them in the gym. I'm going to call them what they are, and I'm going to use them. I'm going to use what the enemy tried to test me with to help strengthen me turn the tables. We become then unbeatable, unstoppable, fierce soldier in guard, God's army, feared by the enemy. Isn't it time you showed the enemy who's boss? It's time to snatch back the power given to you, slapping the snot out of the enemy with the promises of God's word, decapitating the head of the slithering snake of adversity and challenges sent to try to defeat you, feed its remains to the pit of hell from which it came, stand up, rise up, lift up your head, and prepare to be victorious, prepare to win. You see, in good times and bad, God is on our side. When the world is set against you, God, the creator of your world, is for you. When your friends desert and betray you, God is 
always there, omnipresent, and never will he leave or forsake you. When your world gets turned upside down, look up and know where your help comes from. When you get knocked down, know that God will always be there to not only lift you back up, but to elevate you to new heights. When you suffer a loss, know that God can open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that you won't have room to receive. When your family or those who you trust tell lies about you, know that God is not a man. He cannot lie. And when it seems that all have turned their back on you, know that God welcomes you with open arms. Your past is of no concern. He loves you unconditionally. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you just as you are. How can you be assured of this? It comes included as standard equipment. In our design and build, we simply need to invite him in and in having a relationship with him. Won't you say yes? Here I am, Lord. I'm yours. I'm ready to win. Father God, we, we thank you for this powerful word that you have given to your servant to give to your people. I pray, God, that this word encourages the downtrodden, inspires those that are hopeless, lifts up those that have given up, and, and, and empowers those who feel powerless. This world lies. We know the enemy it seeks to kill, steal, and, and destroy everything about your people. But we know that you are the creator, the maker. The, you have the master plan. You are the designer. You know how things function. You love us. You have shown and demonstrated that again and again and again, whether we were deserving or not. You have always been there, you are there, and you will always be there. We simply need to embrace and accept your love as the divine love, as the best love that there ever could be. To live a peaceful life in the face of the unknown, where that doesn't matter. That does not matter. No matter what occurs, it doesn't matter. Because if it takes us out and we're no longer encased in this meat suit, in this, in this body, this design, to be absent from this body is to be present with you. We still win. And God, for those who don't know you, who don't have a relationship with you, who want that relationship, who want to, to activate that love, I pray that they pray this prayer with me to begin that journey, that relationship, the best one they'll ever have, or even to renew it. That prayer goes like this. God, I, I know I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that your son, Jesus, gave up his life for me by dying on the cross in my place, paying the price for my sin, and rose again so that I may be saved. I ask that you come into my heart and I accept your precious gift of salvation, victory over sin, and eternal life with you. Father, all of this we ask and pray in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer with me just now, you have accepted Christ into your life. You have accepted the love that I just spoke of. You have accepted the inheritance of being more than a conqueror. You have, you have surrounded yourself with something that scares the enemy. And as such, I strongly encourage you to immerse yourself in God's word. 
to to study, read, learn, and and have it be part of you so that you know when, not if, adversity strikes, you're able to manage through that, knowing that you are already victorious. When you face the challenges here on earth, you know that you already won. You know whose you are. I only have one ask for you, and I ask this at the end of each message. I ask you to share this message with three other people. That's it. You're choosing your medium, via the website, social media, we're on all the platforms. But just share this with someone so that they too can hear an encouraging word. They too can hear what you just heard and experience what you may have just experienced. That is my charge. That is my charter as God's errand boy to deliver his word to his people so that it will help draw them to him. Will you do that for me? I thank you in advance for sharing this with three people. Thank you for joining. We appreciate your love and support. And I hope you can join us again next Sunday. Until then, go and live your blessed life on purpose. Thank you for joining and worshiping with us today. I hope your soul was fed and thoughts stirred in the sharing of God's word and that today's message will inspire you to live a godly life. Whether viewing on our website or one of the social media platforms, we ask that you consider supporting our ministry with a donation of any size. To do so, please visit our website at www gwtcm.org. That's www.gwtcm.org. We appreciate you and your support. We look forward to sharing God's message with you again. Until then, be well, blessed, and live a life on purpose.